Hi, my name's Lee Goldberg. It's January 8th, 1998, and I'm interviewing Dick Van Dyke in Santa Monica, California. Morning. Now, what's your full name? Is it Dick Van Dyke? My full name is Richard Wayne Van Dyke. And Van Dyke was your original name? You didn't change it from No, that's my else? original name, and Wayne is a middle name that's been handed down several generations. I have a father who had a middle name, Wayne, and a son and a grandson. Wow. Any nicknames like Spunky or Sport or... Uh... No, none that I can uh, say in public. When were you born? I was born December 13, 1925, during the Coolidge administration. Here? <laughs> no, I was born in Danville. <clears throat> no, actually, I was born in West Plains, Missouri. West Plains, Missouri. But I was uh, actually raised in my family. Came from Danville, Illinois. And what did your parents do? My father worked for the Sunshine Biscuit Company. He was a salesman on the road. He was the real Willie Loman with two sons. And what moved you to Danville? Well, that was where my dad was really from. Yeah, I think we were on the road when I was born or something like that. And what sort of influence did your dad have on you? Was he a flamboyant, outgoing sort of person? Yes, he was. My dad was a very funny man, and my mother was a very funny person, too. As, as a matter of fact, between my brother and my mother and my father and me, I was the least funny of all. Now, I imagine being a salesman takes a certain amount of acting skill and, and persuasiveness. Is that where you got your interest in, in performing? Yeah, well, my father never was a performer, but he, he should have been in show business. He was a very funny man, very quick-witted, very good telling jokes. So he was a good salesman for that reason. But he, uh, he could have been in show business, and my mother could have been an actress, too. She was also very, very funny in, a, in another way. So we, we laughed a lot, even though it was during the Depression. <laughs> no, it seemed you should have ended up a salesman. How did you get steered into acting and, and comedy and performance? I don't know. I, I, I got interested in it in high school. It turned out one year I couldn't go out for the track team because I had supposedly a heart condition, which the United States Air Force found out later that I didn't have. So I, I got interested in doing shows, and I sang in the, in the a cappella choir. I appeared in all the musicals and all the plays and everything. I, I, was, I got tall quickly, so I, had, I was taller, taller than the leading ladies, and I had a voice that could be heard at the back of the auditorium. So I was a shoe-in for the parts. Now, was Jerry also acting, your brother? No, my, he didn't do anything in high school. He was an athlete. He was a swimmer and a basketball player. So do you know right away then that's the career goal you wanted to pursue? It was one that I dreamed of pursuing, but back in, in, in those days, uh, it was just too far away. It was an impossible dream to think of ever actually going into show business. There was no television. So you had a choice between vaudeville and movies, I think. And uh, I didn't really think that it would ever happen. Did your father discourage you from this? Did he say, you know, you've got to get a real vocation? No, my mother and father, God bless them, left me alone to make my own choices. Were they pleased with what you're doing? Did they come see you perform and oh, laugh? Oh, sure. They were very, very proud of me right from the very beginning. Now, didn't you get involved in radio while you were in Danville? Yes, I did during World War II. I was about 16, and it turned out that in our little uh, CBS outlet there, most of the announcers were getting drafted, and they put an ad in the paper for part-time announcers. So I went down, auditioned, and got the job. So I was a disc jockey and a newsman at the age of 16. Did you find that all inhibiting? I mean, it seems you were singing and dancing in high school. Was this restraining for you to not be able to tell jokes? and? Well, I, had a, I, I was a disc jockey, and I had a late-night disc jockey show, so I was able to do some jokes. But I kind of enjoyed the profession. I made less than the bag boys at the market, but it was a glamorous <laughs> job, you know. <laughs> Did you, were you confident in your performing skills even then? I mean, did you know you were funny and entertaining? Yeah, I was kind of the, the school idiot. I was the guy that uh, clowned all the time. I really was not that gregarious, but I think it was my way of relating to people. So you were shy, and the way you dealt with it was by being, being funny. outgoing. <laughs> now, you were in the radio station for how long doing this? I was in the, uh, there at the radio station until I myself went in the service. And I went in as into Air Force pilot training, but it was the war was winding down at that time, and they finally washed all the uh, pilots out because they didn't need any more, and I got into special services, performing with a show, so I got some more experience. Now, at this time, were there any performers you were emulating or that you looked up to that were an influence on you? Well, when I was a kid, I loved all of the great physical comedians. I was a, to this day, I'm a Laurel and Hardy fan. As I look back at the things, uh, even today, that relationship that they developed, uh, is unlike any other comedy team that ever existed, I loved Chaplin, I loved 
Buster Keaton, and all the great silent film comedians. So did you try to emulate them even then? Were you doing their shtick? Oh, school? yes. Yes. As a matter of fact, years later, in the early 60s, I got to meet Stan Laurel, and he said, you've been stealing my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yes, I have, Mr. Laurel. <laughs> you do a very good impersonation, though, with Stan Laurel. Well, I, I, I got to be around him some in, in his later life, when he was about my age, as a matter of fact. So I got to really listen to those inflections. Now, when you were in high school and trying to do these shticks, did you hurt yourself? I mean, there must be a technique to Pratt Falls. Well, I, st I really that. studied Pratt Falls. I, I watched particularly Keaton, who, who I think was the greatest of the physical comedians. I learned how to tuck and roll and protect myself, so I rarely ever hurt myself. Is that where you perfected tripping over the ottoman? And uh, No, I think I perfected that well, on the Dick Van Dyke show. <laughs> Now, you mentioned you were drafted. You worked on a program called Flight Time. What was that? That was just a radio show uh, that was uh, out of uh, one of the many places I was stationed in Texas. They needed an announcer for a, a, a weekly radio show with the, you know, with the Army band and that kind of thing. And I auditioned and got that job, too. Sounds pretty cushy. Did you ever see any action or anything? Nope. <laughs> no? That's the way to go. No, the minute that someone said, you, some of you will be going overseas as tail gunners, some of you will be, you know, using your talents, and that's when I started singing and dancing, right on the spot. So in a way, it was like a college education for <clears> you in performing. It really was. I got a lot of good, good experience out of the service. Now, did you meet people while you were in the service that would help you later on in life? Or? Matter of fact, I did. I, my, uh, the man who ultimately became my manager uh, was my bunk buddy, uh, Byron Paul. He had uh, been in radio, I think, before he went into the service. He was some years older than I. I guess I can tell this on television. I, 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 uh, when they wanted a, an announcer, I signed my name up on the bulletin board, and I was in the latrine, standing there, and uh, this man walks up next to me and says, you Van Dyke? I said, yeah, and he's standing next to me at the latrine, and he just hands me this piece of paper and says, read that. So while I was relieving myself, I auditioned, <laughs> and I got that job. And many years later, he went back to CBS, became a, a cameraman, because about that time television came in. And ultimately became a director of some of the of the best live uh, shows uh, back in Danger and Suspense. And, and we'll catch up with Brian Paul later okay. as we get to that period. But once you were discharged from the Army, did you set out to go into radio? What did you do next? I went back into radio. I, I had a little radio show, and, and a, another man and I opened a little advertising agency there. And what prompted you to open an advertising agency when so clearly your, your skills were in performing? Well, at, I, uh, I didn't know. I didn't know what I wanted to do with myself. And uh, my friend uh, had had some experience in advertising. And so we had a few accounts. I did a, a man on the street kind of show, uh, and we did a little comedy show once a week. And I, and I held my, down my job as an announcer. So it was good experience for me. He ultimately moved on to Chicago and uh, much bigger things. Where did you meet this guy, Wayne Williams? He was, he was from my hometown, Danville, Illinois. He was the son of a prominent uh, doctor there. He was some older than I, too. So was it your idea or his to go into advertising? Or it was his. He came to you and said, you got great talent. We could sell some cars. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, you see, it's something like that. Your, your father must have been glad. Here you were doing your performing and being a salesman at the same That's time. That's right. At that time, I was selling time on the radio. Not well, but I tried. Is that why you shuttered it later? I mean, what caused the advertising agency Well, he, he went on uh, to a, a larger company in, in uh, Chicago, and I, I couldn't do it myself. The one thing I never had was a business head. As a matter of fact, I would have starved to death had I not gone into show business. This was roughly 1946? Just about then, yes. So after Wayne went off to do other things, you were left? I was left with my radio job, mm -hmm. which I was perfectly happy with at that time. And uh, I was also in the, Danville had our, our little theater. It was called the Red Mass Players. And so I started a lot of those, Philadelphia Story and No Time for Comedy, plays like that, which I thoroughly enjoyed. What was radio like at that time? Well, there was just there was a lot of network. You know, uh, we had our soap operas in the daytime, and our network shows at night. It was much like television is today. And your show would have been the equivalent of being on an independent station? You weren't a network show, were you? No. No, we were a network station, a network outlet. But I, no, I was just local. Did you uh, aspire to be in more radio drama, to do bigger radio shows? No, I, I had kind of foresaw that maybe I, I could find a niche in television as an announcer. Even then? Back yeah. Back in 1946? Yeah. I, I saw television was coming, and I thought I could make a good living as a television announcer, and that was about the limit of my ambition at the time. I went to uh, Chicago once on the train for three hours, 
stayed in a flea bag hotel all night because I had an audition at WBBM the next day. Uh-huh. And they, did, they didn't call me, and I <laughs> missed the audition. <laughs> you eventually teamed up with Phil Erickson for an act called The Merry Mutes in yes. 1947. How did that come about? Phil had, uh, was, uh, had graduated from high school four years prior to me. He, just, he went out as I was coming into high school, so I didn't know him very well. But he, he was a very well-known family in my hometown. And he, he had an act called The Make Believes, which had been very popular around the country. They closed at the, the I think, the Shea Prix in Chicago. And the act broke up. One wanted to go back to law school or something. And he came to town and was looking for a partner. And at the time, I was rehearsing one of the plays we were doing. And he came and watched. And uh, after he watched the rehearsal, he came up and said, would you be interested in going out to California with a nightclub act? And I said, sure. I had no idea what it was or anything. But I knew that I was ready to move on. And it sounded like quite a lark to me. What was the act? What did you do? We pantomimed lip sync to records, which was in, that, in those days was a very popular kind of entertainment. As opposed to now. When karaoke is not very popular. <laughs> That's right. Well, this is real lip sync, you know, for, for comedy. Right. We satirized popular, popular music. And with, with barely uh, auditioning me, we packed up in his little Chevy and put a two-wheel trailer on the back and drove to California. And the Mary Mutes name, that was your idea? Or his? No, it was his idea. And while you were touring, did you run into any other famous performers or performers who would later become well-known? Oh, yeah, a lot of them. Uh, guys like George Goebel. There were lots of, of teams in those days, and b- long before Martin and Lewis, Noonan Marshall, and oh my God, there's so many of them. Peter Marshall, who uh, eventually became MC of Hollywood Squares. Match came. Had, yeah, and he had a he uh, had a partner. There were lots of teams around. I got to know almost all of them. And the name of the act was later changed to Eric and Van. Was Eric that- and Van. Well, we began trying to put some live stuff in. We, thought, we can't depend on this lip sync all our lives. So we started putting some little sketches and impersonations and things like that. In. Now, when you were doing this, were you still thinking about a career in radio and TV, or had you abandoned that in favor of this? No, I, I really wanted to get into television. I thought uh, eventually I wanted to have a family, and I knew that nightclubs were no life. And I didn't really care for nightclubs that much. And so I was still hoping to get into television. Did you learn skills, though, while doing the Merry Mutes that later served you well in TV? and, and Working film? in front of an audience, particularly, yeah. If you can work to a drunk audience, you can work to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you finally break up in 53? We, we worked around Los Angeles quite successfully for a long time. We were here for a, we worked Vegas and Reno, Palm Springs, San Diego, all around this area. And it's amazing how well we did. We didn't really expect to do as well as we did. We eventually started out on the road, and we played around the country. We went to Atlanta, Georgia, which we fell in love with. At that time, 250,000 people, and still a, a wonderful southern city. So we started having kids, bought houses on the uh, GI Bill, and settled down there, and began casting around for some way to to uh, make a living without being on the road. We did play Miami, New York, Blue Angel in New York we played. Even then, though, wasn't the heart of the entertainment industry in New York and Los Angeles? Oh, sure. So it was yeah. a risk settling in Atlanta. It was a risk. But we did all right, and eventually I started having, I had my two, two sons were born there, and uh, I got a job at a local television station. We were still doing the act at a local hotel. I did my eight-hour stint as an announcer, but they gave me an hour a day in which to entertain. And it's hard to think back now that it, in those days I was in a room of a house, an old house, in front of a fireplace in the living room with one camera, and I filled an hour five days a week How'd with you fill it? nothing. I read the newspaper. I told jokes. I interviewed people, I, whatever I could think of. Eventually, I began to get a little audience to come in, and I'd interview them and, and play with them. And somehow, I fit, filled that hour every day. This was live, right? Live. Oh, yeah. No writers? No writers, no anything. You weren't terrified? Yes, I was <laughs> terrified. I, I can remember every night going home and sitting in front of the television with my wife and kids with a portable on my lap, typing typing up ideas for the next day, monologues and impressions, whatever I could come up with. And I became pretty good, at, not at writing quality material, but lots of it. Did you ever think about getting a partner or someone to help you carry the weight on this show? No, I never did. Who could afford a partner? <laughs> <laughs> Were you also doing radio at this time? No, I, I, I didn't do any radio until my first son was born, at which time I panicked and took a job as an early morning disc jockey on the 
on another station. So I had my television show, my early morning disc jockey, and I was performing at night well, with my partner. You were an institution then in Atlanta. Were these comedy shows? Were you on TV? Were you doing the pantomimes and the Pratt Falls? Yes, we were. And singing and dancing? Yeah. And for a while, my partner and I did a show together, an hour a day, which we wrote ourselves. Tough sledding. Oh, but yeah. we didn't think anything of it in those days. It's odd. Did people pay attention to it? Did it get press? Did it we, get noticed? We did very, very well. We did very well. And eventually, I, I went to, to New Orleans. I was offered a job down there with, they said, a, a writer. But <laughs> it didn't turn out to do that well, and I didn't get any more money. But uh, they tell me that in that market, I was beating Arthur Godfrey, who was very hot property in those days. And I got the attention of the network. And we're back to Byron Falls again. Mm -hmm. Is that all right? Well, before you run off to New Orleans, <laughs> while you were in Atlanta doing this, this shoestring show, what were the studios like? You worked in the living room of a house. Yeah, eventually they did get an actual studio. Uh -huh. uh, they bought a building, and we, we moved into a real studio where we had two cameras. Oh, that was big time. Yeah. So you had, this was, the show was called what, The Mary Mutes Show? Oh, we, uh, a number of different things. I think I had one called The Music Shop, then it was The Mary Mute Show, and then it was The Dick Van Dyke Show, and the, I, I can't remember all the names. What happened to Phil Erickson? Phil eventually, uh, when I went to work in television full-time, opened uh, a club uh, near the Georgia Tech University called Wits End, which I thought was a wonderful idea for him, having been in comedy all his life, and really had a, quite a success with it. He began to do improv uh, comedy there, and uh, the college kids mobbed the place. The college kids became involved in his improv theater. He got to the place where he was sending shows all over the country of uh, the Wits End improv mm -hmm. players. So he became kind of a tycoon. Now here you were doing radio and TV. What was it that made you realize that radio was on the way out and TV was the way to go? Well, I think everybody knew that television was going to be more and more and more. But in those days, it was before the days of... Uh, of any uh, live daytime, there were no sit, uh, no what I want to say soap operas. Mm -hmm. There was only the news, so they were still doing uh, Lone Ranger reruns and things of that kind. So anybody who could fill up an hour a day was a valuable commodity. Now you'd gone out of your way to settle in Atlanta. It must have been a hell of an opportunity in New Orleans that made you give that up. Uh, just a little more, uh, no more money, but a little more in the way of production values. Uh -huh. And uh, I was able to uh, ha go out and. and get my own sponsors. I was a little more in control uh, of what I was doing. And it was a bigger station, better equipped. The writers, producers, directors, anyone we've come to know? No. I don't believe there's anybody down there that you, you would know of outside of me. And how long did you do that? I was only there six months. Only, why only six months? Because my friend. Byron the, Paul From called. the Air Force, Byron Paul, had gone to the network and said, there's this kid that I think is very talented. And he said, if you will audition him uh, and you don't hire him, I'll pay all the costs. Had you kept in contact with him all Yes, I had. And uh, how'd the audition go? What sort of audition was it? It was, at that time, there were a lot of 15-minute shows around dinner time. I think Perry Como had one. And Jane Froman had a 15-minute show in front of an audience around dinner time, seven, I guess. They simply asked, I flew to New York, and they asked the audience to please stay, that a young man was going to come out and entertain them. <laughs> so I did, using some of the material I had written for myself on local television. How different was that experience than what you were doing in New Orleans? Was the equipment very different, the way they made the shows? Different? Oh, sure, everything was much more set, lights and people and directors and floor directors, which I didn't know what that was. Was it intimidating for you? Oh, I almost had a heart attack. I was so frightened. Because at that time, I, were, I had three children, and a lot was riding on it. I would have been perfectly happy to stay in New Orleans and live, but this was a really big break for me. Was it also strange giving up the kind of control you'd had over your own career? I mean, in New Orleans and Atlanta, you wrote your own material, you directed your own shows, you were a one-man band. Here you're no, I, I didn't get that much kick out of it. Uh, no, having help <laughs> was <laughs> nice, and the audience seemed to like it. So they, seemed to enjoy they immediately it. hired you? I went into a meeting the next morning, and they, he offered me a seven-year contract, and I was totally speechless, unable to speak. And Byron Paul was sitting next to me and just went, say yes. This is 1955? 55. Was yeah. the contract really lucrative? In, for me, it was more money than I had ever heard of. 
I think I started out the first year on a retainer that was double what I'd been making. I remember my wife and I walked down Fifth Avenue and just bought each other things. <laughs> <laughs> How did it feel to be in New York at that time? Oh, it was very exciting. Oh, my God, it was exciting. I couldn't believe I was there. Well, well, can you describe some of the energy and what the industry was like in New York when you were there? Well, it was, it was the day of Madison Avenue. Mm -hmm. You know, that was it. Uh, CBS was at 45 Madison Avenue. Everybody had executive haircuts and the Brooks Brothers suits. It was, it was that era. Very exciting time. The time of the, you know, the hucksters. Did you feel like you were at the beginning of something big? I mean, did you sense that you were in the, on the edge of a, tel a television revolution? No, I, I didn't know what was, what was going to happen. I, I couldn't have foreseen videotape, for that matter. Mm -hmm. Everything was live. Everything was live in those days. And the audiences were how big? I mean, were you just you were on the network at the time, right, with this show? I was on the network, and the first thing they did <clears throat> was put me in as anchor on the CBS morning show from 7 to 10 every morning. Of all places to put me, I was not a, really a good newsman. My newsman was Walter Cronkite, as a matter of fact. Can you believe that? So what did you do? You introduced guests and... I interviewed people, introduced guests, did the weather, introduced Walter. It was just, I had no sidekick at the time. It was just me. Wasn't this underusing your talents? I mean, did you get to do any performing or comedy or singing or... I started out on the show telling fairy tales. They gave me a five-minute spot in which I would come on the air and draw cartoons and tell fairy tales. And I, to this day, have a large collection of fairy tales from all over the world. So what was the format of the show? You'd start with a fairy tale, do a. Well, originally it was, uh, <clears throat> who was it? John Henry Falk, who wrote Fear on Trial, the man who, he eventually was taken off the air, I didn't realize at the time, because he was blacklisted, and I was the punk kid who replaced him. But he was, he was the anchor man, and I was simply the storyteller for five minutes a day. And then when John Henry left, they gave me the show. It was a kind of a misuse of my abilities because I, I wasn't that good at interviewing. I was 29 at the time and a little green. How did you feel about the blacklist giving you that opportunity? I mean, was the blacklist pervasive in your life at that time? I knew of it. We knew about the, the McCarthy uh, thing in those days, but I didn't know the, the John Henry Falk story. Only later when I read his book did I realize what was happening to him, happening to him at that time. I would have felt badly had I known, but I didn't really know. Did you have other friends who were being impacted by the blacklist? Or no, you... all of my friends were, you know, very young and not, uh, I only read about it. So it really wasn't a big impact in your career? You didn't sense it all around you? No. It wasn't pervasive? No. So what are some of the challenges of doing this show? I understand Merv Griffin was a regular for one. For the, at the very beginning, Merv uh, was, uh, we had a singer and a, and a girl singer. Merv was, a, and Sandy, uh, oh, I can't remember her name. Matter of fact, the first day I rented a house out on Long Island, it, I had to leave home at six to be there, at five to be there for six o'clock rehearsal for seven o'clock air. Got in my car, turned on the ignition, and smoke came up. The, the electrical system burned up. So I'm new to New York. I get, grab a cab to the train station, get on the train station, and I go right past the New York stop all the way to the end of the line in Brooklyn. I'm lost. I don't know where I am. When I got there, the show had been on the air for 40 minutes. And Merv was there and did a brilliant job, as he later turned out to be the best at that. I almost lost my job because I was never as good as Merv. What was the television community like at that time? Was it a very close-knit, small community? Did you know folks doing other shows? Did you visit other shows? Well, strangely enough, in those days, Grand Central Station, no, I'm sorry, yeah, Grand Central Station had some lofts way up high, several stories up above the, the Grand Central, uh, you know, lobby. And CBS was using those for studios because they had no studios. And Captain Kangaroo was next door to me. He premiered almost the same time I did. And that's where we went to do that show. You must have had a certain jealousy. You would have been much more suited for Captain Kangaroo than reading the news. Yeah, I thought so at the time. I thought so. As it turned out, he was pretty good. Yeah, he wasn't bad. He lasted a little while. <laughs> you know, Bob was great. No, but I thought, that's what I should be doing, really. What was CBS like at the time? How much influence were they exerting on what you were doing and what the show was doing? At the time, I don't think I ever saw an executive around, around the, the, the studio. They pretty much let that show go. Because they had Cronkite, you know, and, it was, uh, and had Charlie Collingwood. 
all of the, the news staff was tremendous. I was the weak link in the show. So apparently they liked you because they kept you around. They kept me around for a while. I didn't actually live out my seven-year contract. They let me go after three years. Well, we Two years to... after that, I was back with the Dick Van Dyke show. They could have had me for peanuts. Yeah, and even now you're with them, but that's, that's another story. <laughs> yeah, I go back a long way. But, you know, in, in those days of Bill Paley, uh, it was a, a bunch of gentlemen, true gentlemen, who ran that network. It was, as they say, the Tiffany network, and it really was. I was so impressed with everyone. Well, what was it that impressed you? What made it Tiffany as opposed to the other networks? Well, it was, it was a, long before the days of the kind of hype we see now. And those men put things on the air that they believed in instinctively. There was no demographics, and ratings were really not highly developed as a science either. They put on the air what they believed in, and they stuck with it. There was no such thing as taking a show off after three or four shows. They, they gave you a season anyway, if they really believed in you. And that's why it was the Tiffany Network. To, uh, now, you know, I don't think an executive looks up from his numbers. Other networks weren't doing that at the time? I don't think as much. Of course, when Pat Weaver came to, to NBC, there was a big creative change then. But at the time, I think CBS was really the one who was the most creative. So you were keeping a close eye on things even then. Were you trying to chart a career path for yourself? I mean, you must have known the morning show was not going to be the rest <laughs> of your life. That was not my thing. I did, I did a couple of pilots during that period. I did uh, uh, an hour variety show pilot with Peter Gennaro and Ruth Price, which I thought was very good, but the network said it doesn't look good enough. Our production values, we didn't spend any money. And I did, uh, I guessed it on things like the Phil Silver Show, Sergeant Bilko, and the various variety shows. You were doing that while you were doing the CBS? While I was doing, yeah. And uh, various things, like, and I did a pilot for a sitcom. Well, we'll get to the sitcom and all that a little bit okay. later. Why did you leave the CBS Morning Show? Why did that end? They took me off. <laughs> I wasn't right for it. Did they put you immediately onto something else? No, they didn't. Uh, I didn't. I wouldn't do anything. Wait a minute. I think I did a cartoon show in there for a while. CBS Cartoon Theater. Cartoon Theater, yeah. How'd Which is a little out? better for me because it was for kids. How'd it, was it your idea or did they approach you after no, the No, they approached show? me with that idea. No, I really never came up with an idea of my own. I knew the kind of a character I wanted, wanted to play, but I... I couldn't come up with an idea. The CBS Cartoon Theater was sort of ahead of its time. Wasn't it you interacting in prime time with cartoon characters? That's right, particularly Heckle and Jekyll. How was that accomplished in, in the mid-50s? Um, how did they do that? They, I, I remember they did all the Heckle and Jekyll uh, stuff on film, and then I, I think they burned it in later. I had to talk to a blank television set, and then those characters were burned in later. We'll get to that in the next tape. In the... In, Stay tuned. Yeah.